Okay, how's everybody tonight? Great. I have these really cool yard signs. So I'm going to do a commercial to help us get the word out. You can put this in your yard. It's printed on both sides. I have the metal pieces that just stick through here and just stick it in your, your yard like we saw, like you saw out in the, on the church, uh, on the lawn. So if you want to grab one of these, we have a few left. There's probably like 10 left or so. And uh, just help us advertise. Now, you're probably going to want to wait after a couple of sessions and see what this is about before you advertise it on your front lawn. So I get that. I understand it. But just to let you know, they are there. Um, I want to do more of an introduction uh, to the book of Daniel for tonight. As Rosemary said, tomorrow at 2 o'clock, you are going to be receiving some um, guides that are going to go along with each session. Um, now, what we had to do, this is a full seminar that actually has more than uh, 30 sessions. It's over 30 sessions that, goes, that uh, these guides you, uh, we use to go over the book of Daniel. But since we're only doing it four uh, days a week and for the month of February, we're going to cut that down. And so we're going to have to condense some of the material, so just to let you know ahead of time. The other thing I want to say is, is actually I want to ask, how many of you have ever read the book of Daniel, the entire book of Daniel in the Old Testament? How many of you have ever read the whole book of Daniel? Okay. Did you find it easy to understand? At first you didn't. Yeah, it, it is a challenge. Daniel is a challenge to understand, especially uh, some of the later chapters. And so we're going to try and do our best to clarify some of the things in Daniel. Now, I want to give some um, introductory and, and background information before we begin. Um, but I do want to say this. What, um, I want to give you our, our foundation for this seminar. So you're going to find that we are going to use, in fact, you have these Bibles just right in front of you, in the pew in front of you. I will be telling you the page number. We're going to be using the Bible. This is our main textbook. I'm not going to be using other, there's a lot of fine books out there that you can find in Christian bookstores or wherever or online. Um, but this is our main text, the book of Daniel. It would be kind of strange to have a seminar in the book of Daniel and we hardly refer to it. We're referring to these other works. Um, there's other sources that help us to understand the book of Daniel. So I'm not knocking those books at all. Um, we need those books and commentaries to help us understand. But um, we're going to be basically focusing, and it's on page 855, just for your reference, on page 855. We're going to be looking at the book itself. Um, so I have some things that I want to share with you. You are going to um, enjoy this seminar because we are going to look at it from, uh, we're looking at the book of Dan Daniel from different angles. Daniel, the book of Daniel itself is roughly split into two main sections. The first section is historical and the second section is prophetic or prophecy. Um, roughly speaking, because in Daniel chapter 2, which is the first half, there's 12 chapters in the book of Daniel. Daniel chapter 2 has an amazing prophecy that we're going to be looking at in the, in the, in the near future. But roughly speaking, the first six chapters of Daniel are narrative. In other words, it's telling that book is, those chapters are telling the stories of Daniel himself, of his three friends, of uh, the Babylonian king, um, and some of the issues that are going on, and it's, uh, you know, the, uh, the witness of some of these Jewish men that were uh, transported to Babylon. So it's a lot of narrative, you're going to find that. From chapters 7 through 12, there's a lot of prophecy. So I want to talk a little bit about prophecy, and I'm keeping this as clear and as simple as I can. When you read the Bible, <coughs> excuse me, when you read the Bible, you come to books called, for example, in what we call the Old Testament or the Hebrew Scriptures. You'll find books with the names such as Jeremiah or Isaiah. Have you ever heard of those books before? Jeremiah, Isaiah. 
And then the Bible has what's called the minor prophets, not because what they taught is of minor importance, but simply because the minor prophets, it, the writings are very small, you know, a couple of chapters as compared to Jeremiah, for example, or Isaiah. Isaiah has 66 chapters in it. Those are big books. And then you have the minor prophets like Amos and Habakkuk and Hosea and these kinds of books. Those are all prophets. There's basically two kinds of prophecies. There's basically two kinds of prophecies that you will find in the Bible. One is called classical prophecy, and the other one is um, apocalyptic prophecy. And I know all of you have heard of that word apocalypse or apocalyptic. I remember years ago when I was, I don't know how old I was, I saw a movie called Apocalypse Now about the Vietnam War. You ever seen that movie years ago, Apocalypse Now? Um, and then nowadays in Hollywood, they are just forking out these movies left and right for the past few decades on, you know, Independence Day and, and uh, uh, you know, doomsday scenarios about the apocalypse. When we think of apocalyptic or apocalypse, we usually think of impending doom, catastrophic events, um, you know, the world is winding down, prophetic countdowns uh, to catastrophic uh, things that are going to happen on planet Earth, a meteorite coming, etc. That's what we think of apocalypse or apocalyptic. So there's two general cl uh, classifications or categories of prophecy, classical prophecy and apocalyptic. Now, those books that I mentioned just a little bit ago, Jeremiah, Isaiah, and these, uh, these others, those are generally classified as classical prophecy. The reason being is those prophets, when they, what, what they wrote and what they say, it's usually words, instructions that have to do with their present time, their contemporary time, issues that are um, relevant for their time and place. Um, with, with, there's some exceptions. It's not just so cut and dry, but I'm talking in general terms. So when Jeremiah is, when you read the book of Jeremiah and you read what he's saying, he may have some prophecies here about how Israel will experience glory in the future. But for the most part, classical prophecy are these prophets that are saying, you know, we have to get our act together. Um, we're not being... Uh, we're not being just and fair with the orphans and the widows and the needy and the hungry. We're being selfish. We're um, worshiping idols. We're uh, worshiping false gods on these altars, etc. They are instructing the people of that day and that time. That's basically classical prophecy. When you come to apocalyptic prophecy, then that's when you get into these weird this weird imagery of symbols and strange creatures with four heads and wings and beasts and there's a lot of symbolism that you cannot take literally. There has to be some type of help, which we believe the Bible is its own interpreter. You've got to interpret symbolism. So for example, um, in apocalyptic prophecy, um, an animal that is unearthly, like a seven-headed animal, will represent something. Um, horns will represent something. Um, even time is represented in a very unique way in apocalyptic prophecy. So, why am I explaining all of this? Which category of prophecy do you think Daniel falls in? It's apocalyptic. It's very apocalyptic. There's another, I will call it a sister apocalyptic book in the New Testament that we are going to reference to help us understand Daniel. And that apocalyptic book in the New Testament, what do you think? Take a wild guess. Revelation. It's the book of Revelation. In fact, the word apocalypse itself in Greek means revealing or unveiling. That's what the book means. So I wasn't planning to say this, but just for example, in Revelation chapter 1, verse 1, 
the verse starts out by saying the revelation of Jesus Christ. If you were to look in the Greek, it uses the word apocalypse, the apocalypse of Jesus. It's a revealing. So that's why your, your servant here believes that you can understand revelation because God is revealing it for it to be read and understood. It's not the most easiest book to understand, but it can be understood. As long as you go by those rules, you let the Bible interpret itself, which leads me to my next point that I wanted to mention. In this seminar, we are going to allow, we're going to reference Daniel, of course, we're going to reference Revelation. We will go to other sources in the Bible to help us understand Daniel. Why? Because our premise is that you let the Bible interpret itself. You let the Bible interpret itself. So I'm not going to give you some, m my opinions that, well, this means this, unless I say, this is what Daniel means, or this is a symbol in chapter seven, and let's see what the angel tells Daniel what that means, which is another interesting thing about apocalyptic uh, um, uh, prophecy. In apocalyptic prophecy, you need it's, you almost always have a heavenly messenger or being to interpret that symbolism because the prophets don't understand what they're seeing in vision or in their dreams when it comes to apocalyptic prophecy. They just, they have no idea. They have no clue what's going on. So there is a heavenly messenger involved to help interpret those dreams or visions in apocalyptic prophecy. Okay, I want to give you some... Uh, spiritual or religious political background to the book of Daniel. And what we're going to do is I'm going to invite you to look at some passages in the Bible that describe this background that leads up to the book of Daniel itself. In other words, the situations that we read about um, in Daniel, <coughs> excuse me, in Daniel chapter one. Okay, so I'm going to invite you. We're going to look at the book of Jeremiah chapter 27, Jeremiah chapter 27, which is on, I'm going to look at, start with verse 4, it's, it's on page 758 in the Pew Bible in front of you, and the Bibles are, they're either black or red, but I think it's the same pagination, <coughs> excuse me, page 758, that's what I'm looking at in this one, so it's not the same one, Okay, so maybe, because I just grabbed this Bible from here. Okay, so what do you have? What do you have on page 758? 758 is Jeremiah. Yeah, he's got it. He's, I have chapter 27, so hold up your Bible, Cindy. Oh, see, <laughs> this is so funny. We've got a Gideon Bible here. I guess the Gideons came in here and placed the Bibles here like they do in hotels. <laughs> no, okay, it's... The Bibles that we're using are these here. They're not Gideon Bibles. Yeah, I don't know. Actually, I don't know where these came from. Okay. All right, 758. And if, uh, if somebody can give our friend over here one of the pew Bibles so we can all be on the same page, literally. Yes, 758. Okay, this is Jeremiah chapter 27. Now, Jeremiah, I already uh, mentioned him. Jeremiah was a prophet who lived just before the Babylonians came and took some of these Israelites captive and took them back to Babylon. Jeremiah was the prophet at that time. And um, scholars call Jeremiah the weeping prophet. Do you know why they call him the weeping prophet? Because the things that he would tell the people in his day, they didn't listen. They derided him. They criticized him. They put him in a pit. They treated him like dirt. This is God's prophet. And so scholars, oh, and more than any other prophet in the Old Testament, he describes his feelings, how he felt, his woes, so to speak. And uh, so they call him the weeping prophet. So Jeremiah is speaking here, and look at verse 4, page 758, chapter 27, verse 4. It says, Jeremiah is talking to Zedekiah. Verse 4 says, and command them to say, this is God speaking to Jeremiah, and he's telling Jeremiah to speak to the people. 
and command them to say to their masters, thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, thus you shall say to your masters, I have made the earth, this is God speaking, the man and the beast that are on the ground by my great power and by my outstretched arm and have given it to whom it seemed proper to me. And now I have given all these lands into the hand of, who can pronounce that name? Nebuchadnezzar. This is God speaking. I've given everything into the hand of Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon. What does it say next? My servant. This is very interesting. God is calling a pagan king of Babylon. What's he calling him? My servant. And the beast of the field I have also given him to serve him. Now, jump down to verse 8. And it shall be that the nation and kingdom which will not serve Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon, and which will not put its neck under the yoke of the king of Babylon, that nation I will what? Punish. So this is very, very interesting. Um, this is why you can see why the people did not like Jeremiah. Now we're talking about the ancient Israelites, the Jews. You can see why they did not like what Jeremiah was saying. Because he's... I mean, this was something very shocking for them. I mean, how dare he say that the God who is our God and the, the God of the universe, and he has control of the universe, you mean he's going to give us into the hands of the Babylonians, and you're calling him my servant, and we have to serve him? This is very shocking for them to hear. But nevertheless, this is what Jeremiah is telling them to do. Now, of course, other false prophets arose in Jeremiah's day, and they would say the exact opposite thing. And so it created some confusion. Well, who do we listen to? These prophets that are saying, no, God will break the neck of Nebuchadnezzar, and he'll break the yoke of Nebuchadnezzar's army off of us, and he'll free us, while Jeremiah is saying, no, you're wrong. We're, we're going to be taken captive to Babylon. Which one do you believe? And so it was a very contentious situation. And Jeremiah, I'm sure he got frustrated. <laughs> So this is what the, Jeremiah the prophet is saying, that this is going to happen in the near future. Now I want to invite you to go to 2 Chronicles. You're going to go back further towards the front of the Bible. And you're going to go to 2 Chronicles chapter 36. I'll get the page for you in a, in a moment. 2 Chronicles 36. I'm on page 442. 442. So, so as not to confuse you, the books of the Bible um, in the Old Testament, they're not necessarily chronologically ordered. So when we go backwards to 2 Chronicles, towards the front of the Bible, we're not saying, well, that's something that happened way before Jeremiah. No, because Chronicles is a book that was written that chronicles the history of the ancient kings and of the nation of Israel. And this is what we're doing right here. So 2 Chronicles chapter 36, and we're going to look at verse 11. This is page 442. <coughs> Zedekiah was the last king of Judah. And this is what it says. Zedekiah says, Zedekiah was 21 years old when he became king and he reigned 11 years in Jerusalem. Jerusalem was the capital of the nation of Judah. He did what in the sight of the Lord? The Bible says that King Zedekiah did evil. Unfortunately, that was <laughs> repeated often in the kings. He did evil in the sight of the Lord and did not humble himself before who? Jeremiah the prophet, who spoke from the mouth of the Lord. And he also rebelled against King Nebuchadnezzar, who had made him swear an oath by God. But he stiff-necked his neck and hardened his heart against turning to the Lord God of Israel. Again, you can imagine the prophet Jeremiah's frustration. Jeremiah was probably saying, you know what? It could be so much easier for us. It could be so much easier for you. You just pay attention to what God is saying. Verse 14, 
Moreover, all the leaders of the priests and the people transgressed, that means sinned, more and more, according to all the abominations of the nations, and defiled the house of the Lord, which he had consecrated in Jerusalem. This is the temple in Jerusalem. And the Lord God of their fathers, verse 15, sent warnings to them by his messengers, rising up early and sending them because he had what on his people? He had compassion on his people and on his dwelling place. That's the temple in Jerusalem. Verse 16, but they mocked the messengers of God, despised his words, and scoffed at whom? At his prophets until what? Until the wrath of the Lord rose against his people. And these last five words are scary. What, is the, what do those last five words say? until there was no remedy. So I'm going to give you some dates here. The first king ever, um, w way before this, way before this, some 500 years before, there was another prophet named Samuel. And uh, when Samuel was a prophet, there were no kings. Um, God was their direct king over the Israelites. And so finally, the Israelites wanted to be like the Gentile or pagan nations around them. These are the Canaanite nations. They said, well, we want a king like those guys, a crown, an army, chariots, all the flash and all the pomp and circumstance. We want to be like those guys. And the prophet Samuel said, not a good idea. And uh, but finally, God says, you know what? Give in to them. They're not rejecting you. They're rejecting me. I'm just going to lay down some rules on what kind of king they should choose. The very first king they chose, his name was Saul. Saul reigned for about 40 years. Then after Saul came David, another 40 years. After David died, then his son became king, and his name was Solomon. After Solomon died, the nation split. And this is where in ancient Israelite history, and you'll read about this in the Bible, you get these two nations called Judah and Israel. They split completely, Judah and Israel. Well, the reason why I'm saying this is because ever since uh, the death of Solomon, then the nation split. The capital of Israel was Samaria, which is the northern kingdom, Israel. The capital of Judah, the nation to the south, was Jerusalem. And you had kings from the north, you had Israelite kings, and you had Judahite kings. All through history, until what we have just read here, Jeremiah the prophet warning them. You have roughly between four to 500 years of kings of Israel and kings of Judah until finally what we just read, there was no remedy because they were just doing so much bad. Now the reason why I'm saying this is because I'm going to interject some spiritual lessons here and there. Think about it. We haven't gone to Daniel yet, but think about it. When the Babylonians came and besieged the city of Jerusalem, it took them a while. I mean, in those days, armies would come. I mean, they had big, thick walls. You ever, you know, seen movies or something? These ancient cities have big, thick walls. And an army couldn't just come and knock on the door and just kick it down. <laughs> I mean, they, they called it besieging. They'd have besieging towers, and why don't we put our cell phones on silent? <laughs> I just heard my phone. Um, and, and it took them a while. What they would do is that they'd cut off their water and their food supply from outside. The army would surround the city until people starved to death inside. It's exactly what happened to uh, the Israelites. In fact, the Bible talks about, this is pretty grotesque. The Bible talks about these two women having, making a deal with each other. And they have children. These two women are talking to each other about their kids and they are so hungry, they're starving because the Babylonians are just outside waiting to defeat the city. And so they suggest to each other, well, and here's the gross part. Why don't we eat your son today and then we'll roast mine tomorrow? Now that's pretty grotesque. I mean, we just heard recently on the news this woman killed her own children. What was it, three children? 
Um, we just, that we're appalled at just hearing of something like this. Um, uh, the Israelites trapped in the city because the city was being besieged, they would take their sandals off and they would gnaw on the leather because they were so hungry. People were starving. Now, when the Bible says there's no remedy, that is roughly a 500 year period of God being patient. And as we just read, sending prophets and messenger after messenger after messenger and prophets, you guys need to clean up your act. Otherwise, this is going to happen. So God, it wasn't for the lack of warning. So when we read about things in God's wrath, etc., well, I don't know about you, but it took God 500 years to finally say, okay, that's it. I've had it up to here. <laughs> that's a long time. That's half of a millennium. So that's some of uh, that background. Now, I want to talk about Daniel a little bit. So we're going to go to the book of Daniel now. And uh, who was exactly this man named Daniel? Who was Daniel? All right. So I'm on page 855, on page 855. <laughs> and before I go with this, I'm just, I'm, I'm checking my notes here. So I failed to mention something before we go into this. Um, I don't know how much, if you have attended Daniel seminars before, um, if you go on YouTube and just type in Daniel Seminar and you, you know, you see presenters presenting the book of Daniel. I don't know what your background is on how much information you have on the book of Daniel. But this seminar, we are going to approach the book of Daniel with the premise, and I think there's very good evidence, we'll be sh sharing some of this evidence later in the, in the, in the course of the seminar that Daniel was written in the 6th century BC. There are some others that believe that the book of Daniel was written in the 2nd century BC. In other words, roughly around 160s BC was when Daniel was written. Whereas we believe that Daniel was written in the mid 500s BC, which is the 6th century BC. And I'll just roughly tell you why. Those that believe that Daniel was written in the later, I know it can be confusing, we're talking about BC, but when we talk about the second century BC, that's much later than the sixth century BC. Remember, we gotta think backwards when we talk about BC. It can be confusing, I know. But the reason why that they believe that Daniel was written the second century BC, and this is a premise, is because when Daniel writes of some of the things that he does in Daniel, <clears throat> in Daniel uh, chapter 2, where Daniel um, uh, is interpreting this dream about the metal man. This man in this dream is made of all metal, gold, silver, bronze, iron. And Daniel is interpreting this dream for the king. And then later in Daniel chapter 7, Daniel himself receives a dream, and it's about these strange animals. Remember we were talking about apocalyptic literature and strange beasts with wings and multiple heads and horns and iron teeth and weird stuff. Daniel himself has a dream, and Daniel chapter 2 and Daniel chapter 7 go together because what Daniel is doing, actually I should say, what God is doing through Daniel is predicting the far future in these dreams, the very far future. In other words, these strange animals and this metal man is indicative of kingdoms, nations. One arises, one falls, the next one arises after it, etc. And we're gonna go over all of this material. Now the reason why some of these uh, biblical scholars of higher criticism state is that it is impossible, it is impossible for anybody to predict the future that far in advance. Impossible. You cannot tell me that the nation of, of the Medes and the Persians are Greece. In fact, Daniel talks about 
um, Alexander the Great, believe it or not. Not by name, but with symbolism. We'll go over this stuff. You cannot predict Greece. Well, the name Greece is, is named, not Alexander the Great, but Greece is named. You cannot predict that far into the future. It's impossible. That kind of predictive prophecy is humanly impossible. Therefore, Daniel must have been written when the Greeks were already present as a kingdom. And Daniel, the prophecies of Daniel chapter 2, the Daniel chapter 7, were written ex eventu. That's a Latin term meaning after the event. So Daniel is actually, according to them, Daniel is written as if it were prophecy predicting the future, but it was actually written when these things had already happened, but he's describing it as if he had prophesied it beforehand. You understand what I'm saying? That's called prophecy after the fact. Prophecy ex eventu. And the basic premise is, there's no way you can predict the future that far in advance. Now this seminar, what we are saying is that Daniel was written earlier and that it is possible to predict the future that far in advance. Therefore, Daniel was written much earlier, even before the Persians and the Greeks came up, came on the scene. And there are internal evidences in the book of Daniel, such as in Daniel chapter 3, musical terms. In Daniel 3, you have this big statue and the king is forcing everybody to bow down to this statue, except Daniel's three friends don't want to do it. We'll talk about that chapter. And it uses certain musical terms. Those musical terms did not exist in the second century BC. They were terms used much earlier. And Daniel's command of the Akkadian language or Aramaic language is another evidence, internal evidence, that the book had to have been, had to have been written much earlier than what some purported uh, to be written. Why is this all important? I, I know this is technical information. This may be boring some of you. <laughs> I know it's technical information. But the reason it's important is because one group says nobody, perhaps I can even add God, the Judeo-Christian God, nobody can predict the future that far in advance which is indicative of what you believe about God, what you believe about prophecy. If you believe that, okay, well, you know, we can agree to disagree um, and not fight over the issue. But there are others that say, no, God can predict the future a million years in advance if he wants. In this case, it's not that long in advance. And so this seminar, um, is, is, um, is coming from that vantage point that the book of Daniel was written early by Daniel himself with the exception of one of the chapters in the book. Okay? All right, so I wanted to, I wanted to clarify that. Daniel, who was Daniel? Okay, let's go to chapter one. And again, tomorrow, at what time is our seminar tomorrow? Tomorrow at two o'clock. So we did say on Saturdays, 11 o'clock and 2 o'clock, tomorrow is an exception. There is no 11 o'clock session, but there will be at 2 o'clock. So tomorrow, don't come here at 11. You can still come to our church tomorrow. We have, we're, we're the Saturday church. We have services on Saturday. You can still come if you want. You're just not going to hear about Daniel at 11 o'clock. Uh, but come at 2 o'clock, and that's when we'll give you those materials. Daniel chapter 1. Um, the background is that, as I said before, reading Jeremiah and Second Chronicles, the Babylonians came, they besieged the city, they conquered it, and they took some of the people. Now, look at verse 3. The king instructed, this is King Nebuchadnezzar, instructed Ashpenaz, the master of the eunuchs, to bring some of the children of Israel and some of the king's descendants and some of the nobles. Young men in whom there was no blemish, but good-looking, gifted in all wisdom, possessing knowledge and quick to understand, who had ability to serve in the king's palace, and whom they might teach the language and literature of the Chaldeans. And the king appointed for them a daily provision of the king's delicacies and of the wine which he drank, and three years of training for them, so that at the end of that three-year degree, 
that three-year associate's degree in Babylonian culture, that they would serve the king in his palace. So this is the political situation. So I started giving that background information before. Now, um, I have, I mean, can you imagine, this is absolutely devastating to the Israelites. Absolutely devastating. Because what Daniel 1 also says, it's as if, um, how many of you have valuables like silver and diamond jewelry and things in your house? Anybody? You don't want to admit it, right? <laughs> <laughs> or you have these valuable coins or some type of collection, very valuable. It means something to you. It not only has monetary value, but it may have sentimental value. In fact, many times the things that are sentimental value are more valuable than the, you know, monetarily, right? My wife, um, she, we still had that rocking chair that she used when my son was this big. <laughs> and she, she takes care of that rocking chair and it's old and it's ugly, at least in my opinion, but it's very valuable. So it's like me coming to your house and I am taking from you your most treasured possessions. Think of your most treasured possession in your house. And it's stolen. I mean, that's stressful. It's devastating. This is exactly what is going on here, except on a national scale, because the Babylonians come and they go into the temple and they take the utensils and things that are gold and silver, I mean the valuable stuff. Can you imagine us going to the mosque, you know, in Jerusalem, the, the dome, and going into, that, in, into the mosque and stealing stuff in there? We'd start World War III, wouldn't we? I mean, they'd kill us. They'd kill us. But the Babylonians came in and they just ransacked the place. These things were beautiful items and they took them back into their own temples. Now this was absolutely devastating for the Israelites to see this happen because then that raises the question, well, who is powerful here? Is it our God or is it Marduk, the Babylonian God? Um, what's going to happen to us in the future? I mean, all of these questions, it was just a very, very, it's an, it was a national crisis of biblical proportions, literally. So this is the background. Now, what I'm going to say may surprise some of you, but Daniel, if you read the book very carefully, very carefully, Daniel was more a statesman than he was a prophet. He was more a statesman than he was a prophet. So I have, you know, I have my study Bible. This is the Bible that I use when I um, um, just read the Bible on my own at home. And I made a chart here in my Bible. This is the coolest Bible. I bought this uh, about three years ago. Every other page is blank. Here's the text, and then here's a blank page. Here's the text, and there's a blank page. That's the way it is throughout the entire Bible. Every other page is blank. Isn't that cool? So you can write your notes in journal, and, and that's what I do. I, I, I do a lot of journaling in this Bible. And the reason why Daniel was more of a statesman than he was a prophet is for a couple of reasons. Number one, if you were to ask, if you were to go to a Jewish Bible, now Jewish Bibles don't have what we call the New Testament, correct? In fact, they don't say the Old Testament. Do you know what they say? They say the Torah, or they'll say Tanakh, or they'll say the Hebrew Scriptures. That's what the Jews will say. If you were, and I have one in my office, I have a Tanakh in my office, uh, published by the Jewish Publishing Society. And if you go and look for Daniel, and its typical place as is in my Bible, you won't find it. You won't find it. Because for them, Daniel is not even classified among the prophets. The book of Daniel is included among the writings. You ever hear this term, the law, the writings, and the prophets? You ever hear that term? 
Well, Daniel is not even classified with the prophets. He's classified with the writings in the Tanakh. You know why? Because Daniel, as a prophet, he was a prophet. He was never called, you read the book carefully, he was never called to share those prophecies with the Israelites. Even though he was in Babylon, he was never called. Jeremiah, Isaiah, some of these others we mentioned, oh, that's all they're doing. The word of the Lord says, you know, clean up your act and, you know, get with the program, etc. That's not the case with Daniel. Daniel did share some of the things that he saw in vision, but with whom? Nebuchadnezzar. <laughs> with Nebuchadnezzar, with this pagan king. Never to the... Now, that doesn't mean to say the captives in, in Babylon, you know, I'm sure, hey, Daniel, you know, so what do you think is going to happen to us in the future? You know, I'm sure there was probably those private conversations. So, number one, Daniel was never called to be a prophet to the people. Not like Ezekiel. Ezekiel was his contemporary, who was also in, in Babylon. Not like Ezekiel. The second reason is this. Now, this, is gonna, this takes a little bit more close. In fact, I should have put this on paper for you. Daniel himself received only two visions in his entire life. Maybe three. So I'm going to look at my chart here. One, let's see, Daniel. Yes. So Daniel receives a total of four visions. What did I say? Two or three? I said I, it's four. Daniel receives a total of four visions original to him in his entire life. Now, I don't know how long a vision takes. We're going to see some of those visions, as I mentioned, in Daniel 2 and Daniel 7 and 8 and 9, 10, 11, and 12. We're going to see some of these visions. But, for example, in Daniel 2, um, one night Daniel is praying to God, God, the king dreamt this, dreamt this dream, and so give me the same dream so I can help him understand it. How long does a dream take? You know, a couple of minutes or something? I have no idea. 60 seconds? Probably not even 60 seconds. Although we think, oh my goodness, it took hours to be in that place. <laughs> Dreams are very quick. Daniel had a total of four visions original to himself. His very first vision original to him that God gives to him comes in Daniel chapter 7. So I want you to look at something. Go to Daniel chapter 7. And I want you to look at this date. Daniel chapter 7. Now, verse 1. Oh, this is page 864. 864. Daniel chapter 7 and verse 1. It says, in the first year of who? Belshazzar, or Belshazzar, or Belshazzar, or however you want to say that. I always say Belshazzar. In the first year of Belshazzar, king of who? Of what country? Of Babylon. Daniel had a dream and visions of his head while on his bed. That rhyme there. In Daniel chapter 7. Now, you won't know what the first year of King Belshazzar is unless you consult a commentary in other books. That's about the year 553 B.C. Now, this is significant. Listen to what I'm going to say. That's the year 553 B.C. Back in Daniel chapter 1, in the very first few verses, it tells you in the first year, or in the first year of King Nebuchadnezzar, or in this, may you say the second year, um, he besieged Jerusalem. Let me give you some dates here. That was 605 B.C. That was 605 B.C. Then you go to 553 B.C. How many years is that? That's roughly 50 years. Roughly 50 years. That's when Daniel gets his first vision. Daniel chapter 7. 50 years. We, it's, it's a guessing game. Nobody knows for sure how old Daniel was when he was taken and he was uprooted from his own uh, nation and his people and taken captive to Babylon. But some say he was probably 17 or 18 years old. He was a young kid. So you add 50, you add 18. Let's take 18 and add that to 50. How old are you? You're 68 years old. 
God gives Daniel his very first vision at 68 years old. Now, you may be saying, what? Well, what about Daniel chapter 2? What about Daniel chapter 4? Daniel chapter 2, that was never Daniel's vision, as I'm emphasizing this, original to him. Daniel gave King Nebuchadnezzar a dream. Didn't give it to Daniel. And then that night, the king was threatened to kill everybody who couldn't tell him his dream. And so Daniel got with his friends and he started praying. And that's when God gave Daniel the same dream he gave to the king. And then Daniel interpreted it. But that wasn't original to Daniel. He was merely playing the role of interpreter. Prophet, of course. Then in Daniel chapter 4, you get this other prophecy. You get this other dream about a tree and it's huge and the birds and it provides shade for all the animals and it's, it's a big gigantic tree and it's cut down. It's a strange dream. It's more like a nightmare. Whose dream was that? It was King Nebuchadnezzar's. It was not Daniel's dream. The interesting thing is when the king comes to Daniel and says, hey, tell me what this dream means. We're not told, but uh, we're told that Daniel interpreted the dream for him right away. He didn't need to pray. He didn't need to get that same dream. Daniel already knew what the dream meant. Now that's Daniel chapter 4. So God waits until Daniel is close to 70 years old before he gives Daniel his very own dream. So Daniel 7 is one dream. Daniel 8 is an, uh, or vision, another vision. And then Daniel 9 is another vision, separate one, that God gives Daniel. And then Daniel 10, 11, and 12 is, is, a, is a, you, you keep them together. It's a unit, so that's four visions. Now again, I don't know how long it takes for a vision to take place. Daniel never speaks to the people regarding these visions. And that's why I say, I'm, I know I'm giving you a lot of information. That's why Daniel was a prophet, yes, but he was more of a statesman. And this is why I know. Because the very last chapter of the book of Daniel in chapter 12, God tells Daniel, he's, he's concluding the vision that Daniel receives, beginning with Daniel 10, 11, and 12. And Daniel 12 ends with these words. God tells Daniel, seal up the vision, for it pertains to the latter days, towards the end of time. Daniel often was confused. He didn't know he himself what he was seeing in vision. And so what that means to seal it up is that many of those things pertain only to the end, towards the end of the world. And I wish I had time to share some more with you what had happened here in the United States in the early 1800s, what we call the Second Great Awakening. I'll just say this. The Second Great Awakening here in the United States of America in the early 1800s. You get a, late 1700s, early 1800s, you get a lot of these preachers preaching. Well, there's this thing called Second Great Awakening. And you know, one of the primary reasons why the Second Great Awakening happened, it was a spiritual awakening, getting back to the Bible and getting closer to God. We have to get prepared for the end of the world and that type of thing. You know why people were experiencing this great spiritual awakening? And a Christianity type of awakening was because of the increased study and understanding of the book of Daniel. That's what uh, motorized the Second Great Awakening were the prophecies of the book of Daniel. And that's why it is so important. So I gave you some basic background information uh, to the book. I could have talked some more, um, but uh, we're close to an hour now. Uh, tomorrow, <coughs> excuse me, <clears throat> tomorrow you're gonna get some handout materials and what we're going to start doing is those materials that you're going to be receiving, their, their study guides, we're going to be looking at Daniel. You're also going to be seeing on the screen um, answers to the questions. So what this is going to do, the Daniel Revealed Seminar, it's going to follow a question and answer uh, format, the study guide that you're going to be giving. It'll have a question, you know, why was Daniel and his three friends taken captive to Babylon? Something like that. And then I'll provide that same question on here with some graphics and I'll have the answer. So we can answer that question live right here. 
And then um, what we're going to do is have a question and answer, uh, spend a few minutes with a Q&A session after each session. If nobody has a question, great. If you do, what I would encourage you on those study guides is just write in your question if you have any questions at all. Okay, does anybody, it's eight o'clock on the dot, don't want to uh, uh, keep you here any longer, except does anybody have a question for me tonight? I don't have all the answers, but I, I have some. <laughs> does anybody have a question? Just raise your hand. No questions. Okay. This book yes. is regarded by the Bible. In English, it's called the Bible. In the original Bible, when came, they were part of the words of God. When came to Angel Gabriel, yes. through Jesus, it is a Bible. Yes. So that is the, this is the same book. It's just English translation. All right. The original book, which was in G, did not come in English. It was translated in English. Yes, I, if, uh, okay, he's asking, he's talking about languages, the original language of the Bible, I think is what you're saying, and how the Bible was transmitted. The original language was Greek, am I right? Yes, okay, so he's talking, okay, so. Uh, the name of the book was in G. Yeah, so the Bible, the original, there's three languages of the Bible. Um, what we call the Old Testament. Hebrew scriptures is written in Hebrew, and then there's Aramaic in there as well. In fact, in Daniel, uh, there's a lot of Aramaic in Daniel. So um, it's written in Hebrew and Aramaic, and the New Testament was written in Greek. Because before the New Testament was written, um, before it was written, uh, Alexander the Great, this is in the second century BC, he uh, went conquering the whole Mediterranean world and uh, he wanted to Hellenize his conquered countries. Um, what that means, it has nothing to do with hell. What it means is he wanted to inoculate all of his uh, conquered people with Greek culture, with Greek language. That's what that means. By the time you have Jesus and the disciples, etc., um, Greek was the language of literature. They may, have, they may have spoken Aramaic and some Hebrew, that's true. But literature was Greek. And that's why all of the entire New Testament was written in Greek. In fact, even the Hebrew Old Testament scriptures were translated about 200 years before Jesus. They were translated into Greek. Yep. They call that the Septuagint. Yep. They call it the Septuagint or LXX sometimes. Okay, any other question? Okay, it's kind of warm in here, isn't it? I'm warm, maybe it's because I'm just talking a lot. <laughs> okay, so what time are we meeting tomorrow? Two o'clock p.m. So why don't we all stand, and I'm going to close with uh, a word of prayer. And then you are invited for your refreshments out in the front. Okay, let's pray. God, we thank you so much for this amazing apocalyptic book that we call Daniel. And we want to be blessed. We want to understand this book because it is very relevant to our situation today and in the near future. We're going to study this, Lord, and you're going to show this to us yourself through your word. So we thank you for tonight and we thank you for the blessings and the exciting things that we are going to discover um, this month. We thank you ahead of time. We pray that you will bring us back tomorrow at 2 o'clock and take us back to our homes safe and sound. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Okay, God bless you. Have a good night. We will see you outside for refreshments.